I am super excited to introduce my guest. He's multi-talented, inspirational, and has survived more tragedies and successes than most people experience in a lifetime. He spent 14 years in the NFL, and he's got a Super Bowl ring to prove it. On top of that, he's a world-class magician. He has appeared on America's Got Talent and is a regular on the Ellen DeGeneres Show. His amazing and emotional book, Life is Magic, is a must read and is being turned into a major motion picture with an Oscar winning producer. I am super excited to introduce John Doran Voss to the Hollywood Dream Maker podcast. Welcome, John. <laughs> yeah, what's going on? Oh, oh my gosh, very bad time. Excuse me. That, that was super embarrassing. Uh, one, oh my God, it's like this flutter. Do excuse me. <laughs> okay. Whoo! I feel so much better. Hey, thank you so much. Totally rock star. Uh, happy to be here. And uh, let's rock and roll. So, you know, John, I created my podcast to inspire dreamers, artists, you know, whether you want to be an actor or producer or whatever, you know, it's called Hollywood Dream Maker. You have a dream, you know, that you go after that dream. And, you know, if you go after it with passion and a vengeance that you can make that dream a reality. You know, for a kid like me who grew up in a broken home, you know, who, you know, you know, had to go through a lot of tough stuff as a child, you know, to be able to come out to Hollywood with 200 bucks in my pocket and a one-way ticket and make that dream a reality and becoming a working actor. You know, if I can do it, anybody can do it, you know? So if you have a dream and a passion, you know, you go after it. And, you know, I... Usually, you know, I've had a lot of guests on my show that, uh, you know, I've worked with, you know, in the movie business, you know, Academy Award winning writers and actors and, you know, we don't know each other. But I watched you perform on, um, it was a Tony Robbins event and you came out and you did, you know, I don't know, like a 45 minute thing or whatever it was. And, and I was like blown away by not only you're an amazing magician, but just your your voice and your message that you're putting out there to the world and i was like who is this guy you know and and, and then i picked up your book and i you know i laughed i cried i was you know super inspired by your book and i was like you know i gotta get john on the podcast and you know i reached out and you said yes so i'm honored to have you on the show man your sh your your, your yeah. story is truly of course man i'm happy to be here and and, and you said something uh if i can you said something that kind of that, that resonated with me already right off the bat and that is you wanted to do something and you went and did it i i think there's so many people that and if you can do it everybody could do it well, trust me, I feel the same way that if I can do it, you can do it, right? But I think here's a very, very simple difference is that there's a lot of people, consistency is hard. Showing up every single day on time, prepared and ready to work and having discipline and realizing that whatever it is that we want in the end is worth saying little no's to on the journey, right? Uh, I'll, I'll tell you this, the only reason I made the NFL, I was not the fastest, I was not the strongest, by far not the most athletic. But what I noticed as I kept playing, I went to high school, didn't get a scholarship, went to junior college, then college, and then pros. All I did is just show up every day. Literally, my key to success is show up and put yourself in a position to be successful. It's very simple, right? I mean, think about that. The minute we stop showing up for ourselves is the minute that it doesn't go our way. You know, you had to come over, overcome some serious obstacles in your life, you know, and, and I and I really can relate to you in, in ways that you can't even imagine. I mean, one, we're, we're both magicians, you know, <laughs> a lot of people don't know that about me. But, you know, I, uh, you know, as a young kid, you know, I started doing magic. And for me, it was a way to escape my what I was going through in my childhood. And, you know, I, I believe that you, you have the same story. So, you know, if you could share a little bit about, you know, your, your childhood and, and growing up with me, it would be great. Yeah. So, uh, look, we lived in Woodinville, Washington, and uh, it's a beautiful uh, neighborhood, about 30 minutes north of Seattle. Uh, my dad was the president of Little League. My dad uh, coached my teams. 
Uh, if you asked me when I was a kid, hey, John, who do you want to be like? I would tell you, I want to be just like my dad. Uh, my mom volunteered at the school. I, I went to Cottage Lake Elementary School and my mom volunteered and started a reading program. My reading comprehension to this day is, is really bad. And so um, when my mom started this reading program, it kind of taught me that there's different ways to learn. There's visual ways to learn and everybody learns differently. And so it was kind of cool because the cool kids liked my mom, which means the cool kids then liked me because they liked my mom. And so I idolized both of my parents for completely different reasons. Uh, we were the Brady Bunch family, li lived in a beautiful house. Uh, and then I was 12 years old across the street playing with some friends. And when I went home, um, I learned that my father had murdered my mother out of nowhere. And uh, it was not, not pretty. So he used a bench grinder and a sledgehammer. Um, he shielded it from me at the moment. Uh, the next morning I woke up, went to a baseball camp, and then he, turned, he ended up turning himself in. Uh, he was tried for second degree murder. Uh, sentenced to 13 years, uh, found guilty, obviously, he claimed self-defense. Uh, at the time, uh, I learned this later in life, that the max penalty for second-degree murder was 13 years. So I think my dad knew if he turned himself in, he gets 13 years. If he tries to cover it up and run, you're facing life or a death penalty. So uh, he got 13 years uh, with good time. He served 11. Uh, he's been out of prison now longer than he's been in. But in that time frame, you know, I didn't just lose my mom. I lost my mom and my dad and, and two people that I loved and respected and, and wanted to be just like. And so my sister and I lived in a temporary foster home for uh, a, a school year. So I, let's call it 10 months or so. We went through the most intense therapy you could possibly imagine. We'd have individual sessions. And then my sister and I would do like a group session. Um, and then we moved down to Southern California where my aunt raised me uh, and my sister when we turned 13. Wow. You know, I have a similar story. Um, you know, my, my father did not murder my mother. Um, I had a dad that was uh, an alcoholic, uh, a womanizer, abuser. Um, I was there for the beatings. I'd watch my father mm -hmm. put my mother's skull through a wall and, you know, have her bleeding out you know, as a child and, and have to witness that, you know, I'd want daddy to come play catch with me and he'd show up and, he'd, you know, beat the crap out of mommy. So, you know, that was my childhood. And then he left like he, he did go away. You know, I didn't I never saw him for a long periods of time, you know, and then when he did show up, it wasn't so great, you know, um, and, you know, he, he killed my mother's spirit, you know, um, he truly, she wished she was dead. You know, she was in a bad, bad place. And, you know, she would numb away her pain and, you know, and then take it out on me because I reminded her of him. So, you know, I grew up with a really kind of tough childhood. So, you know, I can relate to the, 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 the abuse and the loss. You know, um, I know that you found magic at a young age. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, so uh, we finished the therapy, we finished the school year, we're living with the temporary foster home, and then my sister and I moved down to Southern California with my aunt, and then that summer, right away, I went right back up to, to Woodenville to play in the Little League All-Star Tournament, uh, and I stayed with my coach, and it was Coach Schmidt, and his son was also on the All-Star team, and it was their neighbor, uh, Michael Groves, who was a 16-year-old magician who was friends of uh, his oldest son, and so he came over, and he did a trick, or he did like a 30-minute close-up show. I had never really heard of magic, didn't know anything about magic, uh, never seen a trick before that I could remember. And when I saw it, it was by far the coolest thing I'd ever seen. They took me down to the magic store and they bought me uh, probably the first book of a lot of people, J.B. Bobo Coin Magic and mm -hmm. Paul LaPaul, uh, his card book. And I got fascinated. And it wasn't, uh, for me, it wasn't so much learning a trick to be able to perform it and feel cool. For me, I got lost in, in just how difficult something was and trying to perfect it and doing the same thing over and over and over. Uh, and as I progressed through life, magic always stayed with me. I would shuffle cards. And what I realized is those moments when I would do magic with, for myself in my room, that's when the only, that, that's really the only time that the world quieted and I was just a kid. And I wasn't worried about foster homes therapy, moving, 
the, the, the loss that I had, having to grow up early, um, living, moving in with my aunt, all these adult issues, my dad going to prison, all these things, the world quieted. And it was the only time that I can remember I was just a kid. I can relate. You know, for me, it was the same. It was me just sitting in my room with, you know, whatever it was, sponge balls or, you know, just practicing over and over and over again and just being in that moment, you know, being just in that moment, you know, seeing if I could fool myself, <laughs> if I could, mm -hmm. you know, just looking in the mirror and just going over and over. I mean, I, you know, I got started doing magic. I, I tell you, the first time I, 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 I found magic was it was uh, I was in elementary school, you know, and I was kind of getting bullied at school. And, uh, you know, I was that little kid, you know, that had you remember you, winter coats. They used to have these little elastic clips with the, the little clip to clip your gloves on so you don't lose your gloves. Well, I lost one of my gloves, man. And I had this little piece of elastic with this little clippy thing. So I, I attached a quarter to it and, and I stretched it out oh. and I let it go and it vanished. And I was like wow and then i and then i and then at school i was like on a line and there was a bunch of girls and i i went look at the corner and i went like this and it disappeared and they went <gasps> and i was like uh oh there's something here i got something <laughs> so that's when i was <laughs> like <laughs> i was hurt. And, and here's what i love here's what i love about what you just said because it's a framework of how i view life and i know just from from the little bit that we've talked how you view life things happen in life and it's our job that we either say we're going to live in vision or we're going to live in circumstance. And this, whatever this instance is, however I narrate this story and whatever I tell myself about what this is, is going to dictate where I go. And the bottom line is something bad happened. You lost your glove. It's terrible. But if you can take that and say, this isn't happening to me, this is happening for me. Mm. It puts our mind frame in a space that all of a sudden, wow, how about this? Losing your glove might have been the best thing that ever happened to you. But in the moment, it's devastating, right? Yeah. But you found a positive and you actually found a better use for that elastic thing and that clip on your jacket, way better than <laughs> what the glove was ever for. <laughs> so true. And I love that. I love what you just said. You know, uh, you know change your story, change your life, man. And I, I, I got to tell you, you know, for me, I had a story, you know, my fucked up childhood was my story, my abusive father, my abusive mother, blaming, I was a victim, you know, poor me, you know, angry. And, you know, I had the story of abandonment. My father abandoned me, my mother abandoned me, you know, you know, my mother was so fragile at the time, you know, because of the abuse from my father that, you know, she once told me she didn't see me till I walked. You know, so when your your father abandons you and your mother abandons you as a child, you grow up with some issues about abandonment, like you're not worthy or I'm not, I don't deserve love. I don't, you know, this is, you know, you grow up with this story and I carry that friggin' story around with me my whole life as a, as a truth, you know, like this is my story. And I had all this anger and pain and, and, you know, I battled depression and, you know, I just couldn't. I was, I was in, there was a hurt little damaged little boy inside of me. And then I did this Tony Robbins thing. And, you know, they were talking about the story, you know, and I, and I really started thinking about the story. So my mother used to drop me off at this, this heavy set Italian lady, Lily Castellano's house, because she had to work her three jobs to try to provide for me and my two sisters, you know, but when she dropped me off at this lady's house, I felt like she abandoned me, you know? There was this whole abandonment story. But then when I started looking at that story again, and I looked at it and I, and I changed the story, and the story, the real story is, is she loved me so much, mm -hmm. and she knew that she was incapable of taking care of me, that she put me in the hands of somebody who could take care of me. And in that place, is where I found my love for acting. I mean, she put me in front of a TV, so I'd watch I Love Lucy and Gilligan's Island, you know? And that's, you know, where the, the first love of acting, I had to use my imagination in the backyard playing cowboys and Indians and playing. So the story changed for me. It was no longer of abandonment. It was about love. So, you know, change your story, change your life. You know, it's a, it's a powerful thing.
it's 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 the most powerful thing you can imagine i, I love the fact you're an actor because my whole life so I, i'm a total chick flick guy like i'm just a girl standing in front of a boy asking him to love me oh, right you name it i love it I, dude i cried during here comes the boom with kevin james dude dolphin's tail cried like i i i love sappy movies okay i'm, I'm a big matthew mcconaughey fan rom-com get it but here's what i noticed is one because of what i went through as a kid with my parents i'm not into like gore i'm not into torture i'm not into that kind of stuff but with the movies that i was into you saw this character development and you saw the struggle right character hits here but they always come out of it and i realized that that's the arc of life and so anytime something bad would happen to me i literally would write the script of how i want this to end now it wouldn't always end the way i wrote it in my own head but you know what happened is it got my mind right to get on a path and if we can all take our life and write the script out of what we want to see happen, how we want it to happen, and where we're going to go, now all we got to do is just follow the path that we just wrote for ourselves and just make decisions that support that. And it really becomes more simple. The outcome might not be what you wrote, but the outcome is going to be a place that you're meant to be at the time. The outcome is probably going to be happiness. The outcome is probably going to be better for you than what you even thought of, which is a, a really cool concept of i completely believe what you just said write your own script write your own narrative tell yourself a story believe in that story and then just make that story happen you know i love what you say in your book you say um talk to yourself don't listen to yourself love that powerful, uh, powerful. It, that's 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 one of the most uh one of the best pieces of advice that i got with a guy that i speak with on the circuit his name's kevin elko and this guy's just brilliant when it comes to just putting things into, into terms and, and taking people's lives and just paraphrasing, right? He, he'd just look at me and be like, John, don't listen to yourself, talk to yourself. And I kind of just went, oh, that just blew my mind. Because there's a voice in every single one of us that tell us to quit, that tell us to make excuses, that tell us that the, the world's ganging up on me. Why me? It's always happening to me. It's the total victim card. But instead, if we quiet that voice and we just speak our script, we just speak the story that we want to have happen. And no matter how much we doubt it, we just keep telling ourselves that and we keep saying it out loud and we keep listening to it. Next thing you know, it comes to fruition. Next thing you know, you found happiness just that much quicker. And uh, it's a really cool thing. I, I live by that every day. Don't listen to yourself, talk to yourself and, and tell yourself where you want to go and watch what happens to your life. I love that. That's beautiful. You know, it's truly, you know, this to me is noise. You know, the, the, this stuff, the, that little voice, that's damaged mm -hmm. little Billy, you know, that wants to jump into the driver's seat and drive my bus of life, but I can't let him drive. He, he, he sabotages, he crashes, he's, he's the victim, you know? I got to get him out of the driver's seat, put him in here and go, look, put a little seatbelt on him, have a little ice cream. It's okay, buddy. I love yeah. you. You're okay, but you can't drive my bus of life. The powerful me, the confident me, the, the light within me is going to drive my, you know, the God, the life, that's, that's who's going to drive my bus of life, you know? And and that's and, yeah, and, and I think everybody can relate to what you just said, and, and you know, you refer to it as, as the driver's seat, you refer to it as, as that, and I love that, and I just refer to it as living vision, not in circumstance. It's just, every one of us can relate to struggle. This is what I love. The one thing that every person in the world can relate to, I don't care what race you are, what language you speak, how much money you have, what your job is, who you are, none of that matters. What every one of us will forever relate to is struggle, is tragedy, is chaos, is failure. That's something that every one of us can relate to. And I believe that the only thing that separates people is the decision they make in that moment, is the decision of how they stop listening to themselves, start talking to themselves. If they allow that to become a crutch and they allow that to be why they're going to fail, or if they write their own narrative, they write their own script, they talk to themselves and how quick they can get out of that rut and find happiness. That right there, to me, that's what separates us. And uh, um, I love what you just said, because sometimes you do got to put that voice in, in a little seat, put a seatbelt on it, tell it to shut the hell up and then dictate where you're going to go. Yeah, and he, and he always wants to jump back into the driver's seat constantly. You know, it's like a daily, you got to, I got to like put a bouncer at the gate of my <laughs> mind. So when he comes and so, you know, it's like, sorry, kid, you can't come in. <laughs> you know, you're not allowed in. Not allowed in. And, you know? and, and what, and what you just said is I guarantee you something that every, every person in this world can relate to 
and has that feeling every day. But it's the choice. Buckle them up and take control. Yeah. You know, it's really hard. You know, listen, when when shit happens to you, you know, like my childhood, your childhood, to 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 be the victim, you know, to to be in that victim mindset, you know, or this happened to me, you know. And I love, you know, it, it didn't, you know, it didn't happen to me, it happened for me. There's you know, there's growth that comes out of that, you know everything in my life some of the toughest points in my life when it was like shit you know yeah i'll give you i give you a situation you know i, I lost my 11 year old niece to brain cancer and I, and I lost my stepfather to prostate cancer and I, and you know that's the year I, my dog ran out and got hit by a car and died and my wife had a miscarriage and then my wife got diagnosed with breast cancer you know this was like are you fucking kidding me? I'm, I mean, I was literally, life was pounding me down, you know? I mean, I was getting beat, beat up, you know? And at the time it felt like shit, you know? It really felt like I was, you know, in hell, you know? But I, I took that shit and I used it as fertilizer to plant new seeds. And, you know, some beautiful things came out of it. I mean, my school, the Manhattan Actor Studio came out of the shit of cancer, you know? Uh, you know, it was, it was a, I, the worst time and I got this calling, you know, you have to open up a school and acting. I'm like, what? I said, I, I torn my rotated cuff. I had a torn labrum. I was, I was out of work. I was in a sling for, you know, almost a year. I, I, you know, all this stuff was going on to me. I was emotionally a wreck. You know, and I got this calling that I needed to open up the school. And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> but I just, I followed that dream and it came to fruition. And now I have a beautiful school for the past seven years where I get to be the guide, man. I, I've been there, done that. I got the t-shirt to prove it. I've made the dream a reality. Check. Now I just guide people. If you have a dream, whatever it may be, if I can help you and you can learn from my mistakes and I can get you where you want to go further faster because i've already been there that's that's more rewarding to me than me doing an acting job you know i've been there so i i feel like i'm living my dream now my destiny because of the shit of yeah. cancer and you know my wife is cancer free thank god you know we went yeah. through the shit but we came out stronger you learn to love more you, you you don't take shit for granted you don't take life for granted you know you you appreciate the small stuff you know it's 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 just it, everything changes when you, i mean you know listen you've had some some major stuff go on in your life you know i mean you had some health scares i mean can you can, can we talk about that a little bit yeah so um uh i did america's got talent and so i at the time uh i, I well let's back up so uh, i go to college and then play in the pros i play two years in buffalo a year and a half with the Tennessee Titans. And I was going into my 12th season with the Eagles. Uh, right before that, I, I do America's Got Talent. I'm a finalist. And so in my head, I'm rolling. Like I'm life is clicking. I'm going into my 14th year in the league or 15th. It was going to be my 15th season in the NFL, which is crazy. I'm a finalist on AGT. We're booking all these theaters like magic and football are just progressing equally. Right. I'm, I'm playing Monday night football and I'm performing on the world's greatest TV show, selling venues out. And it's just boom, the perfect compliment. Um, Long story short, uh, the Eagles then trade me to the New Orleans Saints. And at the time, I was shocked because I had just broken a record. I had the most consecutive games ever played as a Philadelphia Eagle, which means I played in 162 straight games, which is wow. tough to do. And I thought I was going to retire an Eagle. I'll, I'm going to be an Eagle forever. So they trade me to the New Orleans Saints. And what happens there is I, I get traded right before a game. So I play the game. The next day, uh, I go in and do my physical because the doctors were in town. Uh, and they I, I did a little, you know, breathe on the stethoscope, take a deep breath. All right, cool. Yeah, I'm out. And I go get ready for practice. And they come back and they say, hey, look, uh, there's some abnormalities in, in the heart rate and a murmur. I don't know if you know what a murmur is, but we're going to send you down to the hospital and get tests done. It's just precautionary. Yeah, no problem. So I go in, I go to the hospital, get my tests, come back. And now I'm going to get ready for practice because that's what we do. My 15th season, I'm 37 years old. I love going to New Orleans because for one, it was an all black uniform, which is trimming for a 37 year old pudgy white guy. <laughs> We're indoors, right? So I'm out of the cold weather, of the Northeast playing with a guy named Drew Brees, which was awesome. And then all of a sudden I get a call 
I pick up my phone as I'm going out to practice and they're like, hey, John, surgeon, cardiologist from, from the hospital here, we got your test results. It's not what we expected. Uh, I don't know how to tell you this, but you're never playing football ever again. And you're going to be in emergency open heart surgery probably in the next 48 to 72 hours. And at that moment, you're just like, I'm sorry, huh? Right? Huh? <laughs> they're like, sit down. Uh, try not to cough, try not to laugh, try not to walk fast. Don't pick up anything over five pounds, no caffeine, no soda, no coffee, no nothing. The trainers and doctors are on their way and we'll explain. So, um, wow. Talk about a moment. Um, I, I slid my helmet in the locker and I remember Drew Brees walked by me and I saw his name in like the reflection of, of the helmet. And I went down, I, I took my cleats off and I remember taking my fingernail and kind of scraping the dirt off the bottom of my cleat because I remember that was the last time I was ever going to feel that dirt and so I turn around I see Breeze leave and then I remember which is what we said earlier the story I tell myself is going to make all the difference here now I was at the time I got the news I was bitter I was angry I was telling myself this isn't how I'm going out I've worked way too hard for this this isn't me I was playing the total victim card so what do you do you take a step back and I literally told myself the words we already said John don't listen to yourself talk to yourself this isn't happening to you. This is happening for you. Why? And then I remembered a story of a reporter named Joe Santaliquido. It was 2006. Uh, I had played with the Philadelphia. The Eagles had just signed me. I was going out to a game, and the reporter stopped me, and he said, hey, Dornboss. So I turned around. Hey, uh, can I ask you a question? Yeah, what do you got? I read an article that your mom's best friend sang Wind Beneath My Wings at her funeral. And I just went, whoa, first of all, uh, not a question you're expecting to hear from a sports reporter before a game. And honestly, it was a little bit more due diligence than some reporters do, right? <laughs> it's like, wow, that's an intelligent question. And I looked at him and I said, yeah, 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 she did. She uh, sat behind pipe and drape because it was too hard to sing at her funeral and uh, great song. Thanks. So I walk away and he goes, no, 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 you don't understand. And I go, no, 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 Bet Mittler, 80s, 90s, beaches, great song, weddings, funerals. I get it. See her on Broadway, phenomenal, but I got to go. He goes, no, 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 man. I, I, I know your story. I know where you've been. I know your struggles. Your mom's best friend sang Wind Beneath My Wings at her funeral. And you're an eagle now. Mm. So if you struggle, just open your, wing, open your wings and just let the wind take you. I'm pulling for you, kid. The whole city's pulling for you. Make us proud. And uh, that, that, that affected me. Like that, that just was like, that's amazing. So here I am. Uh, it's now 2017. I'm traded to the Saints. I'm sitting in a locker. I just found out I'm having open heart surgery. My career's over. And all of a sudden, don't listen to yourself. Talk to yourself. It ain't happening to me. It's happening for me. Write your script. Write your narrative. Tell yourself the story. And I literally went from being a victim to bitterness to pure joy, happiness. And instead of crying tears of just confusion, it was tears of happiness. And the story I told myself, I had the wind beneath my wings for a long time. And my mom traded me to a team called the New Orleans Saints. Mm -hmm. I was traded to New Orleans to have my life saved by a saint. And sure enough, a guy named Drew Brees walks by me. And it was her way of saying, hey, life can be great. Life can be good. But sometimes we got to step out of the wind and catch a breeze. And I catch this breeze right now. It's going to save your life. And so that's the story I told myself. My mom traded me. I had the wind beneath my wings. She said, hey step out of the wind and catch a breeze and let's do this. And so all of a sudden there was comfort in this moment of chaos and confusion. And it was like where I was supposed to be. And instead of being bitter that my career was over, I was so thankful that I was alive. I had just gotten married. I was married a month. We just got off our honeymoon. Um, and for people that are wondering, uh, I had a few problems. One was a leaky valve, which means the blood that was leaving my heart was falling right back into my heart. So my heart got way too big. It was a muscle and it just got too big. But then the emergency part is there's an aorta, which is like a vein that leaves the heart and it's, it goes up and over. And it should be about the size of like a dime or a nickel. And I had an aneurysm. And what an aneurysm is, it's like, if you picture a snake and a snake eats a deer, it's like the snake's regular. And then where it ate the deer, it's like this big in the stomach, right? And then it goes back to its normal size. And so uh, I had an aneurysm in my ascending aorta, which means the vein that should have been the size of a dime or a nickel blew up like a water balloon and was the size of a soda can. If that pops, it's you're 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 dead before you even hit the ground, and there is no coming back. Like you can be on the table in surgery, and if that thing pops, it's lights out. And so uh, I, I then became so thankful 
that I was alive and that they caught it. And I started focusing my attention instead of on the things that um, I lost and the memories that I wasn't going to have and all the hard work to get to where I was, I shifted my focus and attention to be how thankful am I to be alive? Um, there's a, a, a kid named Sam uh, Burns who had progeria. And this kid was amazing. I met him through Garth Brooks and the Teammates for Kid Foundation. Uh, and it, it, if you look him up, uh, pejuria is just, it's a disease and it really hinders people and they die too, too quickly. And Sam said this, why am I going to spend so much time focusing on what I can't do when there's so many things that I can do? And I just, I remember thinking that in that moment, that though my identity might have been football from this point on, or from, from you know, that point uh, before, uh, there might be a few things that I can no longer do that I love to do but there's still so many things that I can do. And I'm going to focus more on that and just have peace with the change in my life. And uh, that was a cool thing. That's beautiful, man. You got me a little teary eyed, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's powerful. It's so powerful. Man. You know, change your story, change your life. And you know, but before you and I talked briefly uh, about how pennies have affected your life. Um, when my dad was, when we were going, when my dad went to the trial and it was his trial, um, I sat with my aunt on the steps outside the courthouse and there was a penny and my aunt said, oh my gosh, there's a penny. These are pennies from heaven. And every time I see a penny, it's from your mom. And I was like, oh my gosh, no way. So ever since then, when I see pennies, I pick it up and, and I always just look at it. And if I ever have pennies, I throw them because I know that it's a sign for somebody else. And there's somebody up above saying, throw that penny because a relative is gonna see it and think of me. Um, and so I would find pennies throughout, throughout my journey. Uh, when I was in the hospital and I found out the news when I was in the locker, I then had to go back, long story short, I had to go back to the hospital for way more testing. I got all those results and now I'm, I'm walking back to the driver who was in the parking lot. And I was alone in the hospital in New Orleans after I found out my career's over and I'm gonna have emergency open heart surgery. I hadn't called my wife yet because I'm still processing all this information. And it was the most clean floor in this hospital. And as I go up, and I have a picture, I'll, I'll find it. Uh, as I go up to the elevator, I'm wearing flip-flops and I look down and the only thing on this hospital floor was one penny right by my flip-flop. And I just remember picking it up and going, man, at the moment that I feel alone, man, I'm never alone if I believe. And so um, pennies have, have been a big part of my life too, man. You know, so here, here's here's the story I want to share with you. So, a pennies have been a big part of my life. You know, I mean, as a magician, that was you know that was my opening bit. You know, I'd walk up and say, "Hey, look at this! You find a penny, you pick it up all day long, you'll have good luck." And then I'd stretch it out and I'd manipulate it and make it disappear or whatever. So I've always pennies is my thing. You know, and people know me from my the penny trick, you know, when I, when I go places, people go, Hey, you got the, you show them the penny vent. You know? <laughs> so, so, you know, pennies are, you know, a huge thing for me. And I do the same thing. You know, when I see pennies, I, you know, if they're heads down, I flip them over and, and leave them heads up. So the next person can find that penny heads up, you know, mm -hmm. find a penny, pick it up all day long. You have good luck. So here I am. Uh, I don't know maybe about a month ago. And, you know, I, I've been, I've had hit a couple of little speed bumps in life, you know, uh, recently. And, you know, I was kind of uh, in a, in a little bit of that victim mentality, you know, poor me, you know, boo hoo. And, uh, you know, I went for a bike ride and, you know, I, I was riding for like three miles, you know, and I had life is magic in my ear and I'm riding my bike and, you know, I pull over my bike for a second, like literally, for, I rode for three miles. I pull over my bike for a second. As soon as I pull over my bike in my ear, you're telling that hospital story and you're talking about the penny. And I look down and there's a penny right at the tip of my left toe where my foot, my one foot came off the bike. And this is it right here, man. <laughs> and you know, it was a sign, it was a sign, it was like, I said, I got to get John on the show. And here you are. You know, it's, what's really cool is that uh, that's that penny. Um, I usually take the penny that I find. I have my moment and then I throw it. And I, I, I put it back in the world. 
the only penny I've ever kept is the one I saw on the hospital floor. Uh, and it's upstairs and it's actually right next to a Super Bowl ring uh, that I got uh, from the Eagles. And I look at that thing every day. Yeah. And it's the one penny I kept. Um, and it's cool. And, and, and this brings up a much bigger decision of there might be people listening to this and there are people in the world that they roll their eyes and they think this is the dumbest, most childish thing in the world. And you know what? To each their own. That's fine. But I remember as a kid, and I remember how much I wanted to meet Santa Claus. And I remember how much believing in him and how fun it is. And I've never lost that. I still want to meet Santa Claus. And I'm going to one day. But to make a decision that we can either believe in things or we cannot. We can either choose to make things signs that motivates us or we can just say it's a coincidence and just be on our way. And what I love about that is making the decision to believe in something, making a decision to see something and putting a positive spin on it to motivate yourself to do better in this world, to be better, to achieve more emotionally, spiritually, materialistically, whatever it is you want has nothing to do with religious preference at all. It's a similarity that we can all have, just like failing, just like struggling, just like that moment that we talked about earlier. But to believe in something is something that we can all do. And it doesn't matter who your God is. It doesn't matter where you're from. To make that decision for me was a powerful thing. And it was like when I would sit down and shuffle cards. When those moments happen for me, I'm just a kid. All of a sudden, whatever I'm going through at the moment, it just quiets. It just fades away, even as an adult. And then all of a sudden, you're stuck. You're stuck in that little area of your mind and your heart just being a little kid. And I have a daughter now. She's two. And uh, it has been by far the most amazing thing in the world. But my wife and I just the other day, you know, we were watching her play. And it's like the only time that we've really seen just pure joy and innocence is, is in a kid because they don't know the evil side of the world. And so when I see a penny or I see a sign that I choose to believe in, I go back to that within myself. And some way, somehow, when the mind does that, subconsciously, it figures out the problems that are occurring in my life. And the next thing you know, you kind of snap out of it. And I feel like I know where my direction is. I know what I have to do to, to, to solve this problem. And it all happens with just choosing to believe in it love that you know and, and and i choose to believe that's why i have i saved this penny and i have it and i take it with me i like to keep it in my pocket you know something you know just it's a reminder man yeah you know i i listen for me magic i love people that don't believe in magic you know like oh it's a true you know and when i'm done with them i make them believe it you know <laughs> when I, I love it you know when i when I stick that beer bottle through the bar or, you know, you know, levitate something or, you know, makes, you know, I, I make them a believer. You know, for me, magic is not about like tricking. It's the ability to make people smile. Any place, anywhere, anytime does not matter. I know I have the ability to make somebody smile and make them become a believer and become a little kid for that, for that moment, you know, a homeless guy goes, Hey man, buddy, you got any change? And I pull a big penny out of his ear and I manipulate and I disappear. And, and by the time I'm done with, you got a smile on his face ear to ear, man. And that is the, that is the, for me, truly, that's the power of magic. It's the ability to make people smile anywhere, anytime, any place. I love going into a place and taking over the place, you know, a restaurant. <laughs> and then by the time I'm done, I got the whole restaurant, you know, everybody's together. It's in communities. There's a show going on, you know? And, well, what, what, and it's cool you said that because what I fell in love with magic. I, so when I learned magic, I didn't, I didn't do a trick for years, like literally a couple of years because it wasn't about the trick. And what I found out that magic for me was about the moment, the experience, the energy, and it was a tool to create relationship and connection. And when I discovered that, man, the magic just took off because now it wasn't focused on the trick. The trick's not the end-all be-all. The end-all be-all is creating that moment that's cool. It's going into the restaurant and taking over. And when we leave, we know that we changed those people's lives and gave them something more than just a trick. You know, it's, it's funny. I did this, uh, I did this thing. There's 10,000 people. It was at the, uh, I think it was called the American Bank Center at the time in Corpus Christi. It was a big arena. And it was for the Texas FFA. And I'm backstage. 
and a, a lot of my business is keynote speaking and I tie magic into it. And one of the crew guys there that was backstage, we were just chatting away and he goes, oh, I bet you, you can't make a coin and just take a coin and make it disappear and, and, you know, get a standing ovation from that magic boy, you know, and he, he wasn't a dick. He was just being funny. Right. But like, Hey, I bet you can't make that disappear and get the crowd to care. And so all of a sudden I went, huh. Okay. My entire self journey, that show was to get the crowd, 10,000 people to go crazy over just a simple retention vanish. And sure enough, that solidified this idea that it doesn't matter the trick, but if they care about you, they care about the moment, then the magic's going to happen. And so I went out there and about 40 minutes into my gig, I, I kind of was building this thing up. I was writing this. How do I build this tension as I'm going, tell my story? I took the coin, it disappeared. Crowd went nuts. Crowd went, we bet 10 bucks. And so sure <laughs> enough, I saw him afterwards and I said, yo, pal, come here. I want my 10 bucks, dude. You are giving me that 10 bucks. But there it is, right? It's, it's the moment that the magic creates. Hey, do, do you have that, that penny that you found when you were yeah. back ready? There you go. Yeah, look, can I see it? It's, well, it's small. People at home might not be able to see it. Yeah. Let uh, me, can you stretch it out, make it a little easier to see this way. <laughs> this way, it's a little easier to see. Actually, I love it. Messing with you. Look, if I give it a little massage like here, say the magic words, Sim Salabim, see it disappear. <laughs> see, I get a little row over here like this. Hey, do me a favor, hold on to it for me, okay? Yeah, yeah. Can I see that? Oh, perfect. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. This is killer right here. I'll tell you what, there it is. Love it. <laughs> hey, Penny's changed the world, man. So I, I, I love that. And again, make the decision to believe in something bigger than what we are at the moment. And hey, don't listen to yourself. Talk to yourself and everything goes from there. I love that. You know what I love about your magic? It's how you incorporate your voice in there, you know, your, your message, you know, I mean, you know, you say you do these corporate things and you can, you know, you can put anything in there, but I love your story, how you, you know, your, your, uh, America's got talent. Oh, I mean, what was it? Don't hate, don't, uh, don't hate, don't hate. Don't blame, forgive, right? Forgive. Yeah. You know, it's, it's really cool. And it's, it's ironic that you're an actor that's been there, done that. And now you're an actor that's teaching. Um, I learned this lesson who, who as a kid didn't grow up a David Copperfield fan. That's, that, that's a magician, right? There's come on, uh, David Blaine, all these guys. Right. And I realized that there already is a David Copperfield. The world doesn't need another one. So there's so many magicians trying to imitate him and dance like him and whatever Blaine, same thing. There's already a David Blaine. Why are people going to care about me as a performer? Then I read a quote from George Carlin, who was quoting somebody else. I forgot who he was quoting, but he basically said, they're not going to remember the joke. They're not going to remember the trick or the story, but what they're going to remember is the way you made them feel. And the reason they come back and see you again is because of how you made them feel, not because of the joke or the trick. And I was like, wow. So it was like this self-discovery of what makes me me. And if it's not about the trick and it's about the connection, then why don't I just be a little bit vulnerable? Because I went and saw, are you ready? This is going to blow your mind. My inspirations for my show, which I'm super proud of, it's my life story with magic tied in, is Carrot Top, <laughs> Mike Tyson, Mike Tyson, and Garth Brooks. Oh, wow. So Garth Brooks, if you don't know him or you've never seen him live, is one of the greatest performers of all time. Uh, his, his, uh, his, what do you call it? His encore is talking to fans that hold up signs. Then they give that fan a microphone and he has a conversation with the fans and you can request any song and he plays it. And it's so intimate. And it's so cool. And, and when you watch Garth Brooks perform, whether you like country music or not, doesn't matter. He is up there having fun and you feel like you're the only person in the room and he is literally playing for you. That's an art. That's a, and, and you know what? You can't fake that. Uh, Carrot Top. Carrot Top's ability to use sound bites and quick hitters and just to keep his show moving. If you haven't seen Carrot Top in Vegas, it's probably the best comedy show I've ever seen. And I've seen a lot, but it's so well produced but his ability just to have quick things push your show. And then I went and saw Mike Tyson. He has a one man show. Love it. His, his vulnerability. He's the most feared man in the world, but him also being honest of where he came from, what influenced him, him like, look, I beat that old lady up. I, I feel bad for it. Here's what happened. Here's how I got in trouble. Here's how I learned. Here's you leave his show. And at every time that he struggled, you related because something in all of our lives can relate. And you're like, well, this guy's the heavyweight world champion of the world. Well, if he can do it, I can do it. You're inspired by vulnerability. And, and all of a sudden, he humanized himself for like the first time. Yeah. He wasn't just this monster. There was actually a soul and a person behind that that felt.
felt, that cared, that had grief, that had pain, right? Fear. And we all related to that. And fear. Oh, yeah. And so those were three influences in my show. Um, and, and what you just said about tying in themes is I realized that that's who I am, that I can connect with people and relate to people and inspire people by almost just reciting the script that I wrote for myself throughout my life. And teaching these little tidbits that some of the greatest coaches in the world were able to teach me at, at low moments in my life, whether it was a therapist or a football coach or a friend or, or a relative. And the connection is now not going to be a gratuitous trick. Instead, I'm going to use magic. I want to be a rock star. Can't sing, can't dance, can't play an instrument. So check that off the box. But what I learned is that the cards now were my guitar. And now I can either do a ballad or I can do a jam. And the words in my trick, that's going to be the lyric. And so sure enough, that's, that kind of is what made me me. And I did America's Got Talent and I tried to make things inspirational. And I tried to talk to my 12 year old self through magic because magic for you and I, it created vulnerability and it put us in like this child. It just kept us in this really cool state of mind. Well, if you can relate to people using magic as your tool, well, guess what it does? It creates nostalgia. It creates this, it breaks down this wall. And all of a sudden, everybody are just like kids. And if we can get the world to quiet around them and have them have the same experience you and I had that helped heal us, maybe all of a sudden they come out of that and they've processed something just a little bit better in their own mind that helped them further their own life. And so the tricks that I do, I, I, I try and kind of keep that in mind and uh, not make up stories. They're all true stories in my show. And, uh, I want to talk to my 12, 13, 14 year old self. I love that. If you were to go back, right. If you could talk to your 12 year old self, what advice, you know, now being, you know, I don't know what your age is, but if you could go back and talk to the younger you and give yourself advice, what would that be? Oh man. Always play catch with yourself. And what do I mean by that? Uh, I got out of football. I got a lot of media for my heart surgery. America's Got Talent, all this stuff. And then I did interviews and people asked if I missed playing. Do you, do you miss the NFL? Such a drastic life change. You know, now are you going to perform? Are you going to try and do a comeback in the NFL? What are you going to do? What do you miss? And I really sat back and it hit me. Uh, I was 12 years old and the community in Woodenville and in Seattle would donate Seattle Mariners tickets to me or whoever. And I would go to the Seattle Mariners. I was a huge Seattle Mariners fan. Ken Griffey Jr., Jay Buhner, Edgar Martinez. They were like my Omar Vizquel, my favorite players. I wanted to be them. And so when I was living in the foster family, anytime somebody had tickets, they would call and take me. And I remember being in the nosebleeds. My sixth grade teacher took me, whose name was Mr. Butts. Believe it or not, I had a sixth grade teacher named Mr. Butts, B-U-T-Z. He would take his wedding ring off and just flick it. He would just play with the wedding ring. Just, it's funny what you remember, right? And I, I brought my glove. And here I am in the nosebleeds. In my mind, for sure, Ken Griffey Jr. is going to see me and be like, oh, Dorn boss, you made it. Come on down here in the sixth inning and warm me up before the, before the inning starts. That For sure, right? And then it didn't happen. I'm like, gosh, how did he not see me? He must have forgot. Clearly, he forgot. So all of a sudden, I become a pro. And then uh, I go to Philadelphia. And that guy tells me the, wind, the wind's beneath my wings. And... This is actually a story that always chokes me up. And then I go out a couple games later and I see a kid. And there he is, just wide eyed, looking around, looking at his favorite players. And I said, you know what? It's time for me to be Griffey. And I get that kid and I bring him on down. And I play catch with that kid. And so before games would start, that's what I did. I brought kids. Sometimes they'd be on the field, sometimes they'd be in the stands. But I found a kid. And I would play catch with that kid before the game. And that's the only pregame. I didn't need to stretch. I didn't need to warm up. If I played catch with that kid, I was ready to go. And in those few minutes, I was playing catch with my 12-year-old self, reflecting on everything I loved about the journey, the struggles, how hard it was, how much it was worth it. Um, I would reflect on, on decisions that I made, sacrifices I made. And really what I would think about is all success is about just stringing a series of good decisions together, time after time after time and doing it over time. And it's a hard thing to do. And when I would play catch with myself, um, I was such an appreciation for where I was 
that I think that that is what allowed me to play so long is because I didn't worry about the stresses. I didn't worry about the pressures. I looked forward to playing catch with a kid. And that's what motivated me to constantly make it another day in the NFL, because I didn't want to lose the opportunity to play catch with that fan that didn't get to live it. And so if I got to give advice to my own 12 year old self in a nutshell, not in a 90 minute theater show, just remember that nothing in life is easy and that eventually you're going to be an age looking back and you're going to have to, you're going to have to answer to yourself. And that will be harder than anybody else you'll ever have to answer to. So I hope that you can pull a kid out of life and play catch with them and be proud of every decision you made. And as you play catch with that kid, hopefully he'll be playing catch with you and being so excited and his parents will be taking pictures because all that kid wants to be is you. Be that person for yourself, for your family, for your friends. Be that person for everybody that made a decision to help you when they didn't have to. Be that person so to make that coach proud that stayed late after practice to help you develop something in your game for a teacher that helped you pass a test that stayed later that didn't have to. The best way to say thank you to all these people is that when you're on TV and the camera pans in on your name, everybody along your path gets choked up and is so excited for you to have success. If you put yourself in a position that everybody around you wants you to succeed because you bring a culture, you bring an energy, you bring a joy, you bring just the it factor. If you're that, then you will succeed because the world will be cheering for you to do so. Because you have the courage to do something they didn't because you have the courage to fail and to constantly get up. And instead of looking at failure as just that, you find motivation and defeat and you take one step further. And that coach that helped you with that move or that teacher that helped you, you take one step further, which now guess what? That one step is one step further you went that is now one step further for you, that is harder for you to quit on yourself. And it's now one step further to where you wanna go. Be that person and life will take care of itself. That's beautiful. You know, life is short. You have a dream, go get it. You know, who said that? <laughs> I, I heard you say it and I was like, that, you know, that's what I do. You know, that's like, life is short. You, you know, you know, you said something earlier uh, um, and I don't know if it was on this or if it was just before we were talking, but it was basically like you wanted to get up and go be an actor. And a lot of people laughed at you and said, it's never going to happen. Now, how do I categorize those people? Because they're not bad people, right? But I always tell myself, whether it's true or not, I, this is just what I tell myself. Everybody that said I couldn't do something, everybody that said you're wasting your time, are the people that are talking to themselves. Are the people that are looking at you, regretting that they aren't doing what you're doing. And because they didn't take the shot, and maybe they're not happy, they can't imagine you making it. So instead they have to bring you back to where they are. And that right there motivates me even more to go take a chance to do something that nobody's ever done before or that people don't think I can. Because Jim Carrey, I, I just heard a, a Jim Carrey interview and he was talking about his dad. And I thought this was really cool. He said, basically my dad was a great jazz musician. He was unbelievable. And he didn't make a lot of money, but he was, he was grinding, he was going, he was making it, right? And then all of a sudden my mom had kids. And then my dad had to leave his passion of playing jazz to go get a real job. It was the safe job and he got into accounting. And then all of a sudden, as we got a little bit older, my dad got fired from his safe job and he was absolutely devastated. So we can make a decision to get fired, taking a chance doing what we love to do or get fired in the safe job that we didn't wanna be at either way. So go do what you love to do. Uh, in the Tony Robbins thing that you saw, it was a, a I believe it was the wealth, uh, it was like a wealth, um, yeah, it was wealth mastery, wealth mastery. And it was funny because when they asked me to do it, they, they said, Hey, will you just talk about wealth and what it means to you? And the first thing I thought of is that is that wealth is happiness. Money is freedom. Find your happiness. You'll get your freedom. Think about that. Wealth is happiness, not money not money. I know some very wealthy people that are miserable. And I know some real poor people that are the happiest people I ever met. Mm -hmm. Wealth is happiness. Money 
just allows you to do things. Money's freedom. Get your happiness. I don't care what you do. If you're a toothpick artist and you love to make toothpick art, I promise you, you'll find a way to make money making toothpick art. There's a guy that uh, he actually makes uh, art out of bubble gum. You ready for this? I just got this. This is killer. This guy, are you kidding me? He's like, yeah, I, I, I love making art out of candy wrappers. I'm like, what? This, he did this of me. And are you kidding me? These are all candy wrappers. Wow. These are like the chocolate dinner mints. These are uh, like uh, the brown lollipops. There's lollipop. Hershey Kisses. That is amazing. This is all candy wrappers. So if, wow. if somebody went to him and he said, hey, I'm going to be an artist. I'm going to make a living. Uh, I'm going to make uh, art out of candy wrappers. Most people would be like, you're an, <laughs> you're an idiot. Good luck. But look what this guy can do. So um, that's just a little, there you go. Find your passion. You know, really Fine. go after it, you know, and then, and yeah, listen, money does not make you happy. You know, uh, you know, I, 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 listen, I've, I've been blessed. I've been, a, I've been a working actor for 35 years. I've been, you know, I've, I've had, you know, I, I've had the stuff, the material stuff and, you know, the success. And, and I got to that place where I had all that stuff and I was like, is this it? Is this it? You know, because I, you know, what motivated me for a long time was, proving people wrong. All those people that said, yeah, right, you'll never do it. Well, you know, that, that put a fire under my ass to go, okay, you don't believe in me? We'll see. Because my whole life, everybody, everybody that I told my dream to shit on it. I mean, I remember going to my, my drama teacher in high school, you know, uh, you know, I was a bit of a juvenile delinquent and I got grabbed by the truant officers. They dragged me into the deans and then they brought me to my guidance counselor. And they, my guidance counselor, what do, you, what do you want to do with your life? And I said, I want to be an actor. So they said, okay, well, you know, the, the, go down to the lunchroom, uh, Mr. Carucci, they're doing a, a play, they're doing a Grease. So I went down there and I got the lead role as Danny Zucco and, you know, it was sold out, standing room only, you know, my friends, you know, they, they pull up in a stolen car and go jump in. I go, no, I got to go to rehearsals. <laughs> and they'd be like, yeah, you fag, what are you going to do? I go, no, I'm going to rehearsal. So, you know, long story short, at the end of the play, I went over to Mr. Carucci and I said, Mr. Carucci, I want to be an actor. What do I do? And his advice to me was, forget about it, kid. I was like, what? Wow. So when I had my own TV series and my limo picked me up and I was coming to the premiere of my movie in the same theater that I used to sneak into and dream about becoming a movie, I had my limo, the limo driver said, where do you want to go? I said, take me to my high school. So I had the limo pull up to my high school and I just sat there and I, I said, nah, I'm not getting out for a while. I just left the limo out there, waited, mm. you know, till people found out that, you know, I, I, there was a limo outside. And then when I got out of the car, there was a mob scene, you know, there was girls screaming, you know, because I play like the Fonz type character, you know, so the girls like I scream and so now the police show up and now I have police escorts walking me down the hallway, down into the, you know, uh, cafeteria with a knock on the door and he opens up the door and I go, remember me? I go, I, I asked you, I, I said, you know, I want to be an actor. What's your advice? And you told me, forget about it, kid. I said, so I got to go now to my movie premiere <laughs> and you can watch me every Saturday night on Fox at eight o'clock. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I'm logged out. And, and you wonder if that guy gave up on himself. Yeah. And because he gave up on himself, it's the only route he knew. Yeah, I mean, I look at, he's probably a frustrated actor that never made it, that was teaching drama in a Brooklyn high school. And, you know, he was, you know, had his stuff, but, you know, it motivated me, but, you know, the material stuff is not, doesn't make you happy. So, you know, find your passion, find, know why you're doing it. You know, you know, for me, it's, listen, you, I have a beautiful wife. I have a beautiful son. I am the president of the fucking lucky club, man. I, you know, I, I love the, the most powerful. I mean, it's all about love. It's kind of corny, you know, it sounds a little, you know, but love is all you need. You know, if you truly have love in your life, then you're the richest man in the world. So, so here's a question for you. Uh, how old is your son? He's 14. He's going to be 14. Two weeks. How has what you went through affected your role as that person in your kid's life? Major, man. 
I am, look, I, I was the kid who played catch with himself because I didn't have a dad to throw mm -hmm. the ball. I'd throw my own pop flies and, you know, catch it myself. You know, that was me. Um, I didn't have that. So, you know, and I, and I grew up in an abusive home. So, you know, that made me the most loving father. I am his football coach. I'm his soccer coach. You know, I'm there for him all the time. I constantly tell him every day how much I love him. And I, you know, it made me uh, probably the greatest dad in the world because I, I learned what not to be. I don't want to be that. You know, and I and it made me a, a great husband. You know, I mean, I truly take pride in the fact that I'm a pretty awesome husband and father and, you know, teacher. I love that. And, and what I love about what you just said is, is the idea of. Because I've said this, too, that my dad gave me a perfect roadmap of what not to do. And it's either our choice to either become where we come from and make excuses or just be better yeah. to simply just be better every day. Uh, I remember um, as the trial was going on, our therapist wanted my sister and I to view the autopsy photos and everybody thought he was crazy, crazy, right? And so uh, sure enough, during the trial, it was on TV up in that area and the autopsy photos were arranged in a way that the cameras couldn't see it and nobody could see it but the jurors. And so my therapist got upset. So he went and got a court order and my sister and I were the first minors to have a, a court ordered private viewing of an autopsy photo. We go to the district attorney's office. Dude, I remember this like it was yesterday. We go in her office, she puts the folder on the desk and she just subtly looks at our therapist and says, I, I just don't understand why you're doing this to these kids. She leaves. Therapist stands up and says, hey, everybody thinks I'm crazy that I want you guys to see, see he's talking to my sister and I, that I want you two to see the autopsy photos of your mom. But the truth is, I don't really care. But why should it be anybody else's decision but yours? It's your life. So I'm going to leave. And if you want to look, look. And if you don't, don't. And I'll never ask. Uh, but if you decide to look, there might be a day you want to see your dad. Maybe he's in prison. Maybe he's not. Maybe you're 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. Who knows? If you look at these pictures, if you ever have curiosity about your dad and you want to sit and have lunch with him, it'll be for reasons other than wanting to know what happened. Because this folder and these pictures, that's what happened. And you'll know firsthand. So he left. So what did my sister and I do? We, we looked and we closed the folder and we slid it. And now here it is. It's the moment I was in the locker in New Orleans and I rewrote my story. Um, my wife gets pregnant. I, I have open heart surgery. And now uh, I'm about a year out of open heart. I'm now retired from the NFL, reevaluating my life. My wife gets pregnant. And all these years, I kind of wanted to see my dad for nothing more than curiosity. I didn't really have any, I just, just curious. What does he look like? What does he sound like? Who is he? But nothing, uh, there was no motivation strong enough to, for me to stem action. So now my wife's pregnant and she's about seven, eight months pregnant. And I, I remember looking at her going, I think it's time I see, I want to go see my dad. And I, uh, I want, yeah, it's time. And she was like, wow. So I reach out, I find out how to get a hold of him. He responds. And I meet him uh, up in, in Spokane. And I sit and have lunch with my dad for the first time. And when I was on the plane ride to go see him, I specifically remember my therapist sliding uh, out of the room as my sister and I looked at those autopsy photos saying, if you go see your dad, it's for reasons other than wanting to know what happened. And in that moment, I didn't, I didn't really care about what happened. I realized that the reason I wanna go see my dad is I wanna relive everything the pain, the hurt, the sorrow, the frustration, the betrayal. Um, and I wanted to look at him and, and think about all the things that we should have done together, that we could have done together, all the times that uh, it would have been cool for my, my dad to be in the stands and the crowd cheering me on and my biggest fan and everything that we missed out on. And I wanted to look and find every motivation possible for me to be just like you, for me to be better than where I came from. For me to be a better dad, a better husband, uh, a better father, a better everything. And sure enough, uh, when I went and saw my dad, it was for reasons other than wanting to know what happened. And we sat for five and a half hours and I stood up and said, I forgive you. I forgive you for being lost. I forgive you for making a mistake, both of which I've made many. And uh, yeah, That's and I left. And 
to finally have that moment come full circle. Um, just so everybody, uh, because this is probably, I, I wrote a book, you said life is magic earlier. And out of this entire book, right? This took a long time to write. There's actually one little phrase that is probably what I'm most proud of. And it says, for my wife, Annalise, who turned my heart right side up, and for Amaya, who will always be able to have lunch with her dad. I never got to have lunch with my dad. He was in prison. And when my friends would ask me to, hey, John, you want to go meet my dad and I for lunch? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'd always try and meet them there because I wanted to walk into a restaurant and see a father and son sitting together because I didn't have that. And so for me to write that, and for me to say, hey, and, and ironically, when, when my daughter was born, her name's Amaya Love Dornbos, uh, when she came out, the literally the first thing I, I kind of turned and I held her. And the first thing I told my daughter is that I, I promise you're always going to be able to have lunch with your daddy. And that's a sign of, it's a symbol, it's, it's, a, it's an expression that I will do everything I can to always be there to help you. And, and when there's times that I need tough love, I'm going to try. When there's times that I just need to shut up and let you learn you know, make a mistake on your own and, and learn it for yourself. I'm going to try, but no matter what, I'll always be there. You can always come home. You can always sit with me. I'll always listen. Uh, and I will always be as patient as I possibly can. Your mom and I both. Um, but from what you just said, a lot of people struggle with that. A lot of people use it as a crutch and an excuse to fail so that the world can say, oh, but if you only heard of where he came from and you'd understand, because that's easy. But what's funny is the short-term easy to make an excuse, if you think about it, the short-term easy decision to make our past an excuse of why we're going to fail ends up being a life of difficultness, a life of just grinding and depression and sorrow, when instead, short-term, right, do the hard thing, process it, grieve it. When I was 13 years old, I was on the steps of the foster family. I remember the kid across the street. He had one of those big... Uh, the big bubble thing, you go in the, the pool of soap and you go like this and it blew a huge bubble. And I remember going, oh my gosh, if I could jump in that bubble and float away, whew, I'm just gonna go to a world that just none of these problems exist. My life is perfect, it's gonna be amazing. And I watched that bubble just start floating. It got higher, 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 and then it popped. For whatever reason, when I was 13 years old, that was my aha moment. And I remember going, oh my gosh, if I had jumped in that bubble and floated away, thinking I was gonna go to this world that was just perfect, the only thing that would have happened is I would have fallen twice as far and hit twice as hard. Wow. wow. <laughs> so the answer is not running. The answer is never running. The answer is do the difficult work and grieve it and process it. Come to terms with your reality. Be okay with change. Talk to yourself. Don't listen to yourself. Write your narrative. Tell yourself this isn't happening to me. This is happening for me. Doesn't mean you agree with it. Doesn't mean this is what you want to have happen. It doesn't mean this is what you wished for but something positive is gonna come out of this. Come to terms with your reality and then write your script forward and change, change your future, right? That right there, and, and, and I salute you because it's hard to do. I can say firsthand, uh, it is hard to do, but man, what a happy life we live when instead of becoming the failures of our past, making it an excuse, we just wake up every day to make an effort, just make an effort to be better than where we come from and now you and I both get to live that father-child relationship through the eyes of a dad. And uh, it's been the most rewarding, coolest thing ever to be everything to my little girl that I didn't have. That's beautiful. You know, I've played a lot of roles as an actor. The best role I've ever had to play is father. Mm. It's, the, it's the most amazing role and, and I'm, you know, everything that I went through, everything. I had to go through it to become the man I am today, the father I am today, the husband I am today. So all that stuff that I thought happened to me, it happened for me, it was a gift. And now I see it. I had to go through this shit to come out the other side. Mm -hmm. And I'm proud of who I am and how I came out because, you know, half my friends are dead or in jail. You know, I got out. I followed my path. I followed my passion, my dream, and, and I got it. And I've been blessed. And I look, do I have all the material stuff? Or No, but I'm the richest man in town because I have my beautiful Boom. wife and my son. And you have a beautiful yeah. family. I mean, I, your, your daughter's beautiful and your wife's beautiful. And, you know, you know, I'm just, I'm so happy for you. You know, I'm, you know, so 
what's 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 on the schedule what's next i mean i know i i hear they're making a movie so yeah so uh it's it's funny because what you just said is is what's going on and you heard they're making a movie people ask me a lot how, how did i deal with pressure like the pressures of the nfl how did you do it well it, it was pressures of life and i literally wrote myself as a movie character and when something bad would happen in my life i would think about the the chick flicks that i liked and there's always a happy ending so i know that it, we're going to come out of it and just what happy ending do i want and, okay go make that happen well when i was in games for whatever re- it's probably because of the born identity but like when i was in games and i'd run out to snap i was in my head i was matt damon <laughs> i'm being serious i was matt damon just acting like the biggest badass long snapper in the world and everybody's union and they just want to go home and it's cold and like just just one take this make the snap perfect go down and just let's just go home and all of a sudden it just quiets the noise right and it was just me acting like a good long snapper and sure enough whatever the, the rest is history um so to kind of have this mindset that you've been in your own little movie your whole life uh, the fact that now it's being made a movie is kind of like it, 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 you know um but so basically what ended up happening is there, there's a, a producer named Mike Tolan and Mike Tolan did uh, Coach Carter. He did radio. Uh, he just did the, uh, the Netflix special, um, The Last Dance about the Chicago Bulls and Michael Jordan. And I've been a fan. Uh, a buddy of mine was in the movie radio and uh, he basically was like, you got to meet this guy Tolan. He's an Eagles fan. You guys will get along. So Mike and I meet back in like whenever that movie came out, 2007 or eight or whatever, became friends, didn't really talk about it. Uh, he had Every once in a while, he'd mention, hey, you know, what's going on with your life and this and that. And I just told myself, and, and just to myself, if anybody ever makes a movie about me, I want it to be told. So a couple of years ago, he calls and says, hey, have you ever, what do you think about making your movie, your life into a movie? And I was like, holy cow, this is happening. He goes, have you ever written a book? And I'm like, look, I'm trying, but it's hard. He goes, I'm going to set you up with the writer, Larry Platt. I really think he'll capture your voice. You'll do the interviews. He'll write it and I'll option it. And I'd like to make your, your life into a movie wow so sure enough uh we do it we're writing the book larry platts you know i do the interviews larry writes it it's it's i'm really proud of it and then what happens i get traded i have open heart surgery okay well let's just hold off for a year or two let's see what happens and let's do this okay so then we write about that and then we think we're done and then i'm like hey guys i want to go see my dad and they're like whoa 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 okay hold off hold off all right let's do it and so i i go do it and um yeah so uh John Gatins, who wrote the movie Flight and a bunch of other stuff, is is writing the screenplay. Uh, Mike Tolan uh, is going to produce it. It's called uh, the book is called Life Is Magic. And what I'm really proud of is that I never wanted to be identified as a football player. I never wanted to be identified as a magician. Um, these are things that make me me, and and these are things that I always tell myself. I hope that at the end of it, um, I'm like the movie Big Fish, and I hope that. Uh, which if you haven't seen the movie Big Fish, it's it's the story of a, of a dad and his son. And, um, you know, the dad tells his son these far out stories and the son doesn't believe him. And then the dad's dying. And then sure enough, the dad dies. And what happens? Right. The, the two headed woman comes, but she's a twin and, and there's a midget and a giant and all these things that his dad might have maybe elaborated on. They were really all true at heart. And he just fantasized his life to just have this beautiful life. I, I hope that I can sit my grandkid on my knee and just tell him stories of his grandpa. And instead of being identified as one thing, it's just anything you want to do, just go do it. Give yourself a chance to experience everything in life. And there's enough time to do so. So I'm proud to say that the movie isn't a sports movie. The movie is a, is a story of how I overcame adversity and how ultimately how finding happiness through forgiveness has changed my life and just, uh, amazing ways and uh so we'll, we'll see how this whole thing turns out but that's kind of where we're at that's awesome man i can't wait to see it <laughs> yeah be cool I'm, I'm in the same i'm 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 writing a film right now about my life story and i'm going to produce it and i'm going to make my film because you know it's it's an underdog story it's a it's against all all odds you know it's a rudy it's a rocky it's you know mm-hmm. like how the hell did i make the dream a reality you know, I mean, that's why this podcast is here, you know, because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm blessed because during COVID I created, I had a little more time in my hands and I decided I'm, I'm going to make this podcast and it's global. And now I get to share my story with the world and I get to bring awesome guests like you to share your gold, you know, and bring it to them. You know, that's, and I, and I feel that my story needs to be told, you know, because it's truly about, you know, 
going after your dreams and knowing that your past does not equal your future and that you can achieve anything if you really go after it with a vengeance and you and you put your heart and soul into it and never give up on your dream and you go after it 150 percent and you're relentless in your pursuit that you can make that shit a reality because if i can do it a guy like you can do it that came from where you came from anybody can do it so you hey. know all those stories follow your dreams <laughs> if these two slapdicks can do it you can do it <laughs> <laughs> Hey, John, man, I got to tell you, man, it's a freaking honor and a pleasure to have you on the show, man. I feel like I got to, I feel like you're a brother. I don't, you know, we just met, but I, I got to, I, I, look, I got love for you, man. I'm sending you so much love, man. And, and, and I'm, I'm proud of what you've done and, and what you've accomplished. And I know it's just the beginning. It's just, you know, it's just another chapter in the book, man, you know, and I love that, you know, you're writing your script, you know, and if you're going to write your life story, you make sure that you make yourself the freaking hero, man. Make your, you know, the, the guy that, you know, you get knocked down, but you get back up, you dust yourself off and you get back up and you keep going forward and life's going to give you that. It's going to knock oh, you yeah. down. Oh yeah. You know, uh, look, I, I love movies, right? We love storytelling. Uh, magic is storytelling movies, all that stuff. Uh, one of my favorite uh, accepted speeches at an Oscar was McConaughey. I'm a McConaughey fan, right? But I loved his speech about, you know, uh, he, you know, he he was chasing his hero, right? Are, are you who you want to be? He's like, no, it's it's me in five years. And then sure enough, he's like, five <laughs> years passed. And the same guy asked me, hey, are you where you want to? No, 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 I'm not even close, but it, it's me in 10 years. And the moral of the story is, right, we keep chasing and, and we, may, we, we may never get there, but the journey, um, uh, everything that happens along the way is in line with it and it's going to put you in a position to be wealthy to be happy you're going to find a way to make a living but spend your time doing something that you're proud of spend your time on this world doing something that when people look back they're proud of you so uh, i'm in training camp and uh this guy it's 2006 or 2007 let's say 2007 i'm walking off with a guy named donovan mcnab he's the quarterback and uh, everybody's got his jersey on. It's cool, right? And then the guy about 100 yards away goes, hey, door boss. I, lo I look over and he's like, right, come over here. I'm like, all right, hey, fan, this is great, right? I tried to play it off like I was cool, but I was like, oh my gosh. Like, hey guys, I'm just gonna go sign an autograph. Meanwhile, I'm like stoked, right? There's a fan. So I grab a Sharpie, I run over there. And sure enough, this dude lifted up his shorts and he had a full tattoo of me, mural on the entire inside of his thigh. And I just remember going, Hello, like, I, I, I don't know this person, but boom, there's a mural of me. And he had a lot of nice things to say. Now, there were some other players on his back and, you know, um, but I remember leaving that going, wow, like, how, I mean, I, I, I'm like Griffey. Like, I have an action figure at Griffey, right? And I look at it and it's like, that's, that, that, that symbolizes hope. That symbolizes somewhere I want to be. And though I may never get there, it's just, oh, man, that's how he viewed me. Like, what a trip. So may every one of us that listens to this podcast decide to be that, that if somebody ever tattoos a mural of you on them, <laughs> they look at it every single day, proud, motivated, wanting to be something better than where they were. And it's what I would tell my 12-year-old self, wake up every day and just be that much better than where you came from, be that much better than, than you were yesterday. Just constantly make good decisions, have a goal. And if 90% of your decisions go towards that goal, you'll be on a path of just awesomeness. Amen. Uh, you know, I got to ask, how about a little magic trick for me? I'm the, 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 the podcast okay. person is, sorry, guys, you ch check out the YouTube channel to see the trick. <laughs> All right. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm just going to hold this here. Okay. Uh, obviously magician, you're, you're, you're familiar with cards. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> I want you just to, how about this? Okay. You're probably familiar with what's called magician's choice, right? It's a way to narrow down a force. Meaning let's just say I need you to pick a, a black card. I can say, Hey, uh, you know, red or black. And if you say red, I'll be like, we'll get rid of the reds. We're going to use the blacks. And if you say black, oh, we'll get rid of it. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, I want you to pick red or black, whatever you decide, whatever you say is what we're going to use. Does that make sense? Yeah. If you tell me red, we're going to use the hearts or diamonds. Okay. So whatever you say is what we're going to use. I want you to think of a suit or a color, either one. It's going to be red or black. 
whatever you say we're using, red or black, what do you want to use? Black. Okay, so we are going to use black. Now there's two suits that are black, clubs and spades. Whatever you say, we are using. So if you say clubs, we're keeping clubs. If you say spades, we are keeping spades. You want to use clubs or spades? What do you want? Spades. We are using spades because that's what you said. I now want you to think of any card you want that's a spade. Just think uh, of a spade. Got Ace, it. two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, jack, queen, king. Okay. Now here's a big moment. And it's gonna throw everybody for a loop. You can completely change your mind if you want. Maybe right now you're like, I don't want to think of a spade. I just want to think of a diamond and I'm just gonna think of a completely different card and boom, here it is. So you can technically think of any card you want to. Boom! What a loop. Okay. You got a card that you're happy with? I do. Name the card that you're just thinking of. It's seven of spades. Oh, is it really seven of spades? Yeah. Okay. I, I actually went through here uh, and I actually reversed the aces because most of the time uh, people get nervous on Zooms or whatever. And, and they're like, oh, well, I'll just, uh, I'll think of a, 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 an ace because that's what everybody thinks of. And okay. So that's okay. Uh, here's the deal. Um, these aces uh, are from a different deck of cards. They're actually from a red deck of cards. Mm -hmm. And, and though you didn't think of an ace, that's okay. Uh, what I did is I thought I would actually write a word on the back of these aces. And see, on the back of this ace that's red, I wrote the seven <laughs> of spades. Wow. Just like that. <laughs> the seven of spades. Boom, written on there just like that. There you go. <laughs> awesome, man. I got to tell you, you know, being a magician, watching a magician, I love your magic. It's really well, thanks. You, you know, I was super stoked because there's a part in my live show where uh, I borrow a one dollar bill and uh, it's signed and all that. And the the trick that I saw as a kid was David Copperfield. Um, and well, here it is. Uh, so here's a dollar, and uh, we're gonna do this. Uh, and the trick that Copperfield did on TV was with the pencil, and he took a pencil. Uh, I think I'm in camera there. Yeah. And he would take a pencil and he basically would stick it right through the center. But now look, I, I was a kid, so I didn't have hundred dollar bill. Well, it's a little off, but that's okay. I didn't have hundred dollar bills. Right. So I would practice it with ones. So even today in my show, I, I don't use a hundred dollar bill. I use a one uh, for a few reasons. One, it's a hundred two. I'm not David Copperfield. And to be honest with you, this trick is 50, 50. It either works or it doesn't. And I can always pay back. Uh, I can always pay people back a, a, a buck, but check this out. Right. It sounds like it rips. You can hear it, see it, but there's no hole, no tear, no nothing. And now that's really cool. Now, uh, I don't know if you heard it with my earbuds on. Um, regardless, it sounds like it tears, uh, but this is really cool here. Um, so now we can take it um, and just set this in there. And actually a pencil, uh, the eraser and the metal weighs the same amount as the actual pencil. So the balancing point on a pencil is kind of a cool thing, I, I think. But now you won't even hear it you're just going to see it watch go right through the center just like that and it goes through the center <laughs> now when i was doing this i wanted to end it uh but i didn't want to end with with a one because i always started with it so i thought it was a really cool line to say look i, I know that when i was a kid i would do this trick uh with a uh with a one dollar bill but i never ended it but i never liked all the the current routines of how people would change a one into a hundred i just didn't like the technique so uh, with Danny Garcia, we came up with this. Look at this change. This is so killer. And it looks like you change a one into a hundred, just like that. And it's just such a cool change. Uh, and then we give away a hundred. So um, I love taking old ideas, right? And working with people that come up with better, cooler ways than like, because I'm sure you're familiar where you take the thing and you're yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. fold it up like this. And then it's like so small. And then you got to like carefully open it up. You know what I mean? That was uh, but I, I, I love that change. Awesome. <laughs> All those, you know, it's that 10,000 hours, man. You know, it's putting 10,000 hours, baby. You know, you, yep. the gift that you had to be able to snap that ball, you know, all that practice, all the training, all of that, you know, paid off in game day when that clock was running out and you had to make sure that ball was exactly where it had to be. And, 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 and you made that, you know, when you, when you're on a stage like America's Got Talent, you know, and you gotta, you know, you gotta be able to deliver, you know, I mean, I just had a curiosity for me, 
I mean, I know as a magician, you know, I used to have nightmare story dreams that I would, I wouldn't be able to hold the penny, you know, like the penny would <laughs> fall, you know, like. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I would have that, you know, but you know, being on that grand stage and with the, you know the 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 energy and the nerves and you know how did you kind of deal with like the nerves of having to snap that ball, put it exactly where it needs to be, or have to be able to you know do that trick, having cameras on your hands and you know in front of an audience like that? How do you deal with the nerves? Yeah, great question. Um, so I think one of the things that post football my, my post football career that I'm really thankful for in being in the NFL is it really taught you about process and it really taught you about like knowing your job and, and knowing every in and out and showing up every day on time, prepared, ready to work, put the time in, research it, know your outs and take things on so many different levels. When we would do a game plan for an opponent, the guy that I would go against, hopefully I knew more about him than he knew about himself. Every tendency is one finger down, two finger down. Is he standing up? Is his left foot forward? Is his right foot forward? And a lot of these people would have tells, right? So you study it. So being able to take that into the magic world and to be able to sit back and really what I what I love is that when I do a trick, you know, you film it, you film yourself doing something. I don't watch it to gloat. I watch it to correct like game film. Oh my gosh, what line would have worked here? What could I have done different? What's the beat? What could I have done? Da, 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 da. And you grade yourself. And then you constantly improve yourself. So, uh, you know, how, how do I deal with pressure? Uh, if you're prepared, then you really don't feel the pressure. If you're truly prepared, it, it comes down to the very basic, right? When you were a kid and you had a test, if you knew all the answers, what did you care? If you didn't know anything, you were stressing like you couldn't believe, right? If you're prepared, it's all good. So now all of a sudden, you, you put in the work, you practice, you, you do, you change the one into 100, 8 million times. You're in the car every time you're at a red light, you do them every time you're at a stop sign. Just, it's just you live with this. You're the guy in the grocery store behind your wife like this. And people are looking like, what is wrong with this kid? He's just taking this dollar bill. and like, you know what I mean? You're that guy. Uh, you're the guy that keeps a penny in it. You know what I mean? Uh, that when all of a sudden the lights go down and that one halo lights on stage and the world is watching, instead of being nervous, you take a deep breath. The hairs rise on your, on your arm and it's the calm before the storm. And you hear the, the, the crowd start to quiet. And when, you, when I open my eyes, there's nowhere else I belong except right there in that exact moment. And when you put all that time in and you prepare, every time I, I write your script, every time I would, I would do a snap or every time I would think about snapping, it was perfect every time. Every time I do a move, it's perfect in my head, right? So you've already been there a million times. Now just let your body do it. Don't get in your own way. Just let your body do it and just realize that there's nowhere else I belong except right here, right now. Now just go kill it. That's my attitude. But if you're not prepared, it's hard to do that. So just prepare. I love that. You know, I tell my students all the time, if you fail to prepare, you prepare to fail. You know, it's all about preparation. And that's what gives you confidence is, you know, I've done the work. I've put in the hours, you know, I'm, you know, as an actor, you know, you want to know your lines. <laughs> You know, if you don't know your lines and you wait, you know, what's my next line? You know, you're not in the moment. Yeah. You know? So it's yeah, really you're not. Yeah, it, it's really cool. Uh, I, I got some actor friends and it's really cool to hear them go back and forth. And, and it's funny because you talk to actors and they're like, I, I don't act. I become. Yeah. Like you literally immerse yourself. And I'm, I'm not an actor. I literally was a soldier in 1949. I literally was that. Sure. And how, what would I if I was that person, how would I be? And then it's like, boom. So, but the only way you can do that is to be prepared. I love that. Nice. That's magic. Yep. That's it, baby. <laughs> hey, thanks for listening to the show. Please rate, review, share this with your friends. Subscribe if you haven't. Please take whatever you get from here, the golden nuggets, and apply them to your career. Go after your dreams with passion. Don't let anybody tell you it can't be done. I believe in you. Follow your dreams. I'll see you in Hollywood.